Okay, so well, uh, welcome to lecture two, um, uh, experimental design for machine learning and multimedia data. Again, the first couple of lectures, a little more theoretically, um, but again, we're not gonna go too, too bad on this. It's mostly gonna be sort of applied math. Um, and um, again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to text me or feel free to actually just say them. Um, if you say them, they're, as far as I know, recorded, but also this is a very interactive class. Um, while the first couple of lectures by nature have to be more like unidirectional, um, please do not hesitate to ask any questions or concerns, okay? So this is going to be interesting stuff that, that um, uh, is not taught in a lot of places. And so um, bear with me, okay? And if it seems weird to you, um, another thing you can do is I'm gonna start office hours. They go Monday 1 p.m. to uh, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Um, that could help you with the homework. Uh, again, the homework is optional. I'm gonna give you the homework. The homework is mostly applied information theory, but not really theoretic, more like think about probabilities, information, machine learning, scientific model, these kind of things. And then later on, it's gonna be more like, okay, so think about this image, think about this video and so on. And um, obviously I want you to do them despite the fact that they're optional. Uh, it means I don't grade them, but they will help you greatly sort of instill what's going on. And the first homework will be out today. I will put it on the website and announce it on Piazza. And if you have questions, what I'm doing is I usually have office hours, one to 2 p.m. on Monday, in my office. Now, obviously, we have COVID restrictions still, and so we're gonna just use the same Zoom link as you are in right now. And um, yeah, let's take it from here. Now, um, where are we? Here we go, today. Today, we're gonna talk about the scientific process in machine learning. Are we gonna talk about the, so we're gonna repeat this, and then we're gonna, Talk about the information flow in that scientific process because that's actually how you understand how to design machine learning experiments at least <clears throat> according to how i do it and then we will look at traditional ai a little bit right because you can't just go and and discuss deep learning from scratch um we, what we do is we will look at the shannon number the shannon number is shannon's estimate of how complex chess is and we will connect that to the notion of the uh, information flow in the scientific process, and especially to the notion of what, you know, is called memory equivalent capacity, okay? Um, and I hope that through uh, this routine, you get an intuition for what memory equivalent capacity is and how to apply that to machine learning before we go into depth and figure out how to actually get to an estimate of the memory equivalent capacity for a neural network, for a deep learner, for all of these kind of weird um, uh, machine learners, and also how we could try to figure out do we need more or less memory equivalent capacity given this machine learner or given another machine learner on your data, okay? So this is where this all leads, and that's obviously experimental design, and it's especially interesting when you try that on videos and on, on images because there you can save so much. But Let's go start from scratch again. Um, I'm gonna go a little faster, but there's also gonna be more information um, than last lecture. You have seen this last lecture. This is a repeat for the people who just joined. I saw a couple of people actually just signed up for the class um, after last week. So what we did last week is we went in the scientific method. And the scientific method obviously is something where you have an observation that can start with ouch, an apple fall on my head, and I'm Isaac Newton, and I wanna see why did it fall on my head, how fast did it fall on my head, what influences the speed, how it falls on my head, and all of these kind of things. And then I go ahead and do data, like I measure, 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 and I vary sort of the input variables, like the height of the apple, right? I keep the apple the same, but vary the height. And then I change the apple, but keep the height. These kind of things, the systematic sort of exploration of a what we would call a scientific experiment. So now I have all these observations, I record them in a table, okay? And as I record them in a table, you get a theory, and the theory then gives you predictions, and then um, uh, what I hope is that I don't have to have my table anymore, I want to basically uh, go from scratch there, and this is uh, uh, sort of where you go, right? And now the interesting thing is that in that process, which is like, 
older as even. It's really, really old. We have computer uh, things that help us. Like we have simulations where you go from theory uh, that you created, sort of, hmm, what if I use this formula and have this, it simulate dropping more apples, right? What if I do this? And the question is, do the apples look the same way when I use this formula? Or I don't know, does the apple go to light speeds? Right? Then the formula is probably wrong, right? Um, or um, the, or, and this is the most interesting part that we figured out last time, is we added machine learning to the whole thing. Now, it's not a simulation, it's machine learning. It's basically you say, huh, I dropped all these apples from different heights. Can deep learning figure out what the formula is and predict what the speed is for the next apple, right? That would be how we augment the scientific process using machine learning. And then I said, for me, data science is the science of automating the scientific method, okay? Um, so that's, that's basically uh, what we discussed last time. And then we discussed this process in a little more detail. We said, here's what's going to happen. You are there as a human measuring things, creating a table. Mostly when you do scientific endeavors, it's a table of some input vector, right? So it's like um, the height of the apple, the weight of the apple, um, Maybe that will be just the two actually by now. And then the output could be the speed it falls down, right? Or the pain level on my head, uh, which is harder to establish, but still it could be something you could, you could do. So it's, it's a mapping from experimental input to experimental observations, okay? And then I said, okay, what we now do if we understand machine learning in the scientific process, the way we did before, then what happens is that instead of having Newton look at the table, we have computational logic look at the table, okay? Um, a finite state machine, this is what we have. We have some neural network, some random forest, some Gaussian mixture model, some deep learners, some active reinforcement learning, or all these new hype technologies, reality, reality in the end are different algorithms in running on a finite state machine and what my real, real output should be is not so much just predictions, but actually what I really wanted to be, if it was human, I wanted to come up with some really, really, really compressed way of describing my table, which in the end we would call a rule or, you know, in math, a formula, right? And so really the thing is that Einstein got famous when he predicted that the calculations of the physicists would be wrong uh, for the, the um, is, uh, um, um, whoop, when the sun, uh, well, sun obscured by the moon. Sorry, I'm missing the term. When the sun gets obscured by the moon, um, and, he, and he was right. And all the physicists were like, wow, why we were wrong? Why is he right? And he said, it's relativity, and here's the formula to predict it. Now, what we are trying with machine learning is to replace that scientist and hopefully get that formula out. Now, the funny thing in machine learning is it kind of works just by, you know, validation and, and training set, but you get a lot of more parameters out. And it's really interesting how, um, like, MIT is bragging about, oh, we have this model that has terabytes of parameters. I'm like, congratulations, you have a beast you can control, right? Um, but in reality, you know, there's problems to that, and we will discuss this in this lecture, what the problems are beyond um, the non-control and beyond the fact that um, it uses a lot of compute, okay? So, um, we also went through a couple of definitions last time, um, which was intelligence is the ability to adapt, and an equivalent definition, just to be a little bit more clear, uh, uh, clear is the ability to adapt to change, um, the first one, the one that I present here, is the original one from the creators of the IQ test. The, the, um, the one that is uh, ability to adapt to change is the definition from, um, uh, well, we don't know, but officially attributed to Stephen Hawking. Now, the next thing is, um, there is actually a paper by Marcus Hutter on trying to define intelligence. What was very interesting is that, again, just like, um, just like um, I just said, the, the, the model should be really small. The shortest definition usually wins, and that's called Occam's razor. 
So for me, the ability to adapt is four words. That's pretty good. And of course, it's not a perfect definition. For example, you can now go and say, well, is my underwear smart? Because if I put my body into the underwear, the elastic expands and it adapts to my body. How cool is that? Well, yes, but what I could say, it's at least smarter than underwear that doesn't have an elastic that doesn't adapt to you. But now calling it underwear intelligent seems a little not so clear. But the point is, barring a perfect definition of intelligence, we will use this one as it really works for us. So why does it work for us? Well, because we say machine learning adapts a finite state machine to an unknown function based on observations. That unknown function is obviously the formula we want to get out. And the observations are obviously the lookup table that we create when we make them, right? As I said, experimental input, experimental output. And now we need to formalize this a little bit. So we say the input is n rows of observations that in machine learning are usually called instances, okay? So if you have your cat dog classifier from computer vision, it's going to say, well, cat, one cat image is an instance. Yes, it's basically nothing else, however, than a row of observations because you can obviously serialize the image and just put it into a row of a table, right? So uh, you can even do that with a video. It's going to be a very long row, but it's still a row, okay? So if you think about it, in memory, everything is linear because our memory is linear. So you can totally fit everything into that uh, idea. And by the way, the fact that uh, we treat everything as a table is the essential idea in data science at UC Berkeley. Um, we, in data science, if you take data science, the, the early freshman class, uh, then the first thing is they give you a table. Okay. And that is, I think, one of the major innovations at, at UC Berkeley that we teach you this way, but it, it allows a bunch of things uh, to happen. Um, and it also has been done that way in the data community, for example, the, uh, the very large databases community. Relational databases are a thing, and they have been a thing for a long time, so there must be something right about them. So for us, what we'll do for the rest of the lecture is we will say we have n rows of observation, which you can call instances, in a table with a header, right? And the header is nothing else but saying there's an x1, x2, xm, which is uh, x1 to xm is sort of our features, right? Or of the columns of the table. And they have names, right? They could just be pixels, then they don't have names. Or it could be something like, if you know the Titanic task, something like passenger ID, uh, how many uh, did you pay for the ticket? Are you male, female, and so on, right? So they could be semantic or they could be non semantic. And f of x is obviously our observation, right? So, so there's a, we assume there's a function from the input to the output. Now, we all know this may not be true. It could be true that you have two, the same input vectors twice and two different outcomes, right? Then it's not a function. But then there's other stuff happening that we will discuss later. What it basically means is you miss some input feature, okay? Your input dimensionality isn't chosen high enough. Okay, so to disambiguate something like this, you need to add another factor. Okay, so each of the axes is a factor, and m itself, by the way, is an assumed dimensionality. Okay, because you could as well see that first part as a matrix and then it becomes a dimensionality. Okay, just to, um, just to uh, leave this there. Uh, it's really as simple as that. You can see it mathematically as this, uh, you know, m plus one tuple, or you can see it as the header of a CSV file, or you can see it as a relational data table. Really, I don't care. Whatever makes it easiest to you to think about this, okay? Um, and now the output is that we say, okay, we present this table with n rows, and you know m features and an f of x and now the state machine should actually figure out first of all with training how to map you know the x1 to xm like all these rows and columns to the output function but furthermore and this would be memorization right the easiest way to do that memorization would just be to use a lookup table a dictionary right we use a dictionary so we just store x1 to xm in a dictionary and have uh, the result f of x come up. What's the problem with the dictionary? The problem with the dictionary is that if one x 
changes a little bit and was not previously recorded into the dictionary, it's going to say, I can't look this up. That's it. Dictionary failure. It throws an exception. What we really want is that it automatically sort of finds out, oh, yeah, this is close enough to the other, uh, to the f of x. So we should be able to just basically go and, and uh, say it's f of x. Okay. And that is called generalization. And we try that usually without having a perfect notion of how distant uh, uh, or how separate our validation set is. We try that usually by separating a training set and a validation set. So if you were creating a um, lookup table and use the validation set, you would totally fail. So it's a good test of adaptation to use a validation uh, set. However, the question is, is that enough? And of course, I'm going to answer this in this lecture, and you will see that this is really the minimum you can do. There's a lot of more stuff you can do. Okay, so the thought framework will be so from now on, as I said, you have uh, some XIs that are of they are real numbers. In reality, they are floating points in your in your computer, but you can really make them real numbers. I'm totally fine with that as a thought framework. And then we have some f of x now. For now, the next couple lectures, this is very important. There's going to be an overhanging assumption in everything I say that we have a balanced binary classification task. Okay? I will teach you in later lectures how to get away from this assumption because I'm very well aware that most tasks are not balanced and also you never have just two classes. It's usually a lot more. Like even MNIST is already 10 classes, right? But for now, it makes our thought process so much easier to just think about a balanced binary classification task, okay? And we will not always be balanced, and I will tell you when we're not, and, but we will always be binary for the next couple lectures, okay? Now, we keep it there. Um, uh, and, oh, yeah, and I said last time, and this, this concludes the last time uh, summary, I um, said last time, um, how many states does M need to model the training data, right? Um, and the interesting part here is that um, that is basically your experimental design question, okay? So can we predict in some way, shape, or form, given the data, which machine learner would be better? And what's the, what would be a typical outcome if I use that machine learner? So we can double check our result that we get when we train the machine learner against these expectations, right? And I said earlier, right now, if you compare AlexNet to VGG16 to DartNet, there's orders of magnitude difference. And the big question here is, can we do something about that? Can we, can we change this? And the way to look at it on a high level across all machine learners, not just one machine learner, um, is to first of all formulate this as a generic question. And the generic, what we do know, what is true to all machine learners that they've ever seen in practice, is that they're all implemented on a finite state machine. Okay? Your laptop, your cell phone, your, your desktop PC, whatever you use, it's a finite state machine. It doesn't have unlimited memory. But even if it had unlimited memory, even if you wanted to see it as a Turing machine, the interesting part is not the memory itself. Uh, the interesting part is the, the logic of the Turing machine, and that is a finite state machine. But also, we have to be very careful because we can use one real number to completely store any table we ever want in a Turing machine, right? Because real numbers are infinitely long. And then what? And then what about the generalization there? Is that right? I don't know. And how do you do that? So it's not about storage so much. But sort of what is the logic that makes sort of the inference between the points that we didn't give in training, right? Because that's the whole point of generalization. Um, let's go for it. Any questions so far? I mean, it's mostly a more in-depth summary of what we did before. And by the way, I will do it in many, uh, I will do it in lectures all the time this way that we, we, we bring up some concepts that probably leave a lot of question marks. And then the next lecture, I come back to them, go a little deeper. But I want us to, like, after that, have, have, have a solid understanding, at least, of the idea. And then the homework will help you nail this down. Any questions so far?
Okay, and they're not come up right now. That's totally fine. Let's, you know, whenever they come up, pop them in, okay? So let's do a thought experiment. And this is a very interesting one where people often get things confused. I have a question for you guys. <laughs> Which image, the left or the right, has more information? And then, which image, the left or the right, takes more bits of memory? I just need people to, to randomly answer this. You can do this in the chat or, or not. Um, so it's basically two answers, and each of them is left or right. I could do pulling, let's see. Oh, my mouse fails, so let's not do pulling. Sorry. Okay, um, should I try to, it's just a discussion question, okay? There's no, I mean, there's a right or wrong, you'll see, but I, I obviously don't expect you to say right or wrong right now. Okay, so I'm gonna just randomly choose people. Aryan, <laughs> what do you think? Which image has more information and which image takes more bits of memory? I feel like the left one will have more information, but the right one will take more bits of memory. I'm pretty sure I'm wrong though. <laughs> okay. Let's see some other guesses. I don't want to just put them in a, maybe Nadia. Uh, I'm not sure, but maybe the one on the left, because it also looks like uh, there are more pixels in it. So that might have more mem more information and also take more memory, but I don't know. Okay, so I see I made some mistake, which is I have to put on myself. So assume that both images have the same amount of pixels, okay? Um, so then maybe Harrison. Uh, in my opinion, it's gonna be the right image has more information because it's a picture of a whale, so that's information. But the left image is gonna take more bits of memory because the right image is a lot of repetition in like the pixels, so it's gonna be easier to compress. Very good, that is the answer. Um, so, Here's what's interesting. The left bit, the left image, assuming they both have the same amount of pixels. Um, when you do an LS minus L, when, and you know, it really doesn't matter what compression you use. When you use LS minus L on this left image, it's gonna show you a lot more bytes used on your hard disk, okay? While on the right, with this, okay, so first of all, stop. Um, I go one more back, sorry. So first of all, if, if these images have the same amount of pixels and you do not compress them and they have the same resolution, then of course, both images have identical amount of bits that they occupy on the hard disk, okay? And that's the interesting part. So if we were just memorizing both images using regular, um, without any compression method, and they are both at the same amount of pixels and they both have the same amount of color depth and all of this, they would absolutely take the same amount of information, okay? And the same amount of uh, bits on the hard disk, I mean, okay? So now, to answer this question, the first question, which image has more information? Well, the right one, because what we see here is a whale shark in the water that I photographed while scuba diving, right? So for me, that's totally cool. Um, and uh, the, the idea here is to just basically, you know, I can tell you a lot about this web chart and there's dorsal fins and this is a Wikipedia image now and so much information. On the left, well, it's noise, okay? Maybe you can say something about Whatever noise, it's difficult, right? There's no information. So what I can say about the left image, though, is the left image has definitely more uncertainty as of what I see compared to the right image, right? So the left image is full of uncertainty and the right image is not, okay? Well, there's some uncertainty still left, right? But now, how would I measure how much uncertainty is on the left versus how much uncertainty is on the right, okay? Now, again, if I just memorize both images and they have the same resolution and they have the same amount of depth, I wouldn't see any difference. But now comes something interesting. 
I say, let's use a compression. We could use zip, or we could use JPEG, typically JPEG, right, or PNG. And then what happens is that the image on the left, using any compressor, will not get smaller. And the image uh, on the right is getting smaller with some compressors, OK? Um, so this one, for example, would it lend itself well to compressor that just it's basically these assumes that whole blue here on the right is basically um, just the same blue. And then all I have to say is, OK, uh, 50 lines of blue. And it's very, very compressed compared to exactly this thing on the left. OK? So here we go and we see a first idea of how we could go about to measure things with regards to a, a compressor, okay? So both images have the same memory requirements, but I, there is ways to extract rules and repetition from the right one. And that means some compressors will do really well on the right one and some compressors but there's basically will be no compressor, almost no compressor that do really well on the left one. Now, some compressors may do well on the left one, but they will never do as well as the compressors on the right one. Okay, so for example, I will show you even more. If I take this away right now, oops, um, sorry. If I take this away to the previous slide, forget the slide itself. But I ask you now, how much do you remember of the left image and of the right? The funny thing is that of the right image, you can say, oh, it's a whale shark uh, in blue. And maybe you may remember that example for a long time. And on the left, you couldn't even reproduce the first pixel. Was it white or was it black? I don't know, it was just noise. While on the right, you could say, oh yeah, I know the first thing was blue. There was a lot of blue around. So, so you have a much easier time memorizing this because you know what? Because your brain also needs to compress, okay? But this is just an intuition. We get into this a lot further down, okay? And by the way, I think the first pixel on the left on here is black, okay? So does that make sense to people? Are there questions about this? Yes, it makes sense, hopefully, that's what I want. But if you have questions, please, please shout out. Um, so there's yeah. an intuition about information that's happening mm -hmm. here, right? So like, what if, what if the image on the left is something else that's much higher resolution, but it's encrypted, like it's XORed with, with noise, and so it looks like noise? Like, um, I guess, is there a, a more, um, like, w would that, like if, if the noise, if, we're, if it's not actually noise and if it's, if it's just a pattern that's too complicated to recognize. And, and I, I get that, I mean, this is kind of an allegory for like the state of machine learning. Like it's, it's problematic to assume that there is a pattern when really it's just noise. Um, but yeah, I, I, I guess um, how does that affect, um, or I, I guess what is, what is information here? <laughs> okay, what is information is on the next slide, okay. But um, you have a couple of very good questions that I really like. Um, I can start with the last one. The last one is you say it's really problematic to assume you can infer some patterns when there are none. You need to know that this is human nature, okay? So generalization, and we will learn this in this lecture, generalization, there is what, well, Berkeley calls this, and you probably all have heard this in 189. Uh, most people have 189 background, right? There's a bias variance trade-off, right? And I would call this bias variance trade-off a memorization generalization trade-off. How much do you need to memorize of the data versus how much can you actually generalize from the data, okay? And now the answer here is that on the left, you can generalize anything without making mistakes. I can totally go and smooth out all these noise pixels to be uniform gray. Now we generalize the image away, but we cannot say anything. It's, we, we, got a, we lost a lot, bunch of information. So if you measured accuracy against the original, it would be terrible, 
okay? And so we have this, there are fields in human nature that are like this. Astrology is a good example. Astrology decides we, we generalize the entire population into 12 different categories according to their zodiac or star sign. Awesome, it's an awesome generalization. Wow, we all have a label one in 12. But how accurate is that, right? And that's the problem. You can be very scientific, but how accurate is that, right? And so that's basically, uh, first of all, the answer to this. Now, the second problem is, there could be an algorithm that can solve it, right? Maybe there is some algorithm that can solve it. Maybe for some reason I find an algorithm that can solve it. And we'll see later, this is basically the same, and it's a little bit the same problem as the P equals N, it doesn't equal NP or equals NP problem. But it's like, you always have the hope that there's something that can solve it. Now, maybe there's something, okay? Maybe the next quantum computer can do this thing and compress this thing down to nothing and completely reproduce it. I don't know. What I can give you is engineering rules, given the current state of the art, to find out whether you can do it or not. Because that ultimately is what matters. Um, and that's where we're coming from. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, I love this, it was a really good question because there is a little bit esoteric in this, okay? There is something weird in this that, that, that you should not ignore, okay? But if you're engineers, we just have to stay focused and build something, okay? Now, what is information? Information has been, has been defined by Shannon as the reduction of uncertainty, okay? And now this is the point here. On the left image, we kind of have no way to reduce the uncertainty that's in there because we don't know how. It's, it, the only way we can help there is we can memorize all the pixels. And on the right, oh, there's a lot of blue repetition. So let's reduce that uncertainty. I can predict if the pixel is blue with a very high probability the next pixel on the right is also blue, right? That's reduction of uncertainty. And it has to do with probabilities. That means we try to say if the chance is high, let's just guess that, okay? And here's what's very interesting. Um, if, I know this class here has different backgrounds, which is really cool, right? So on the left, you have minus log 2p is what we all learned in 61c, right? So let's say you have a 16-bit number uh, as a binary number. Well, how many decimal numbers can be encoded? Well, uh, 2 to the power of 16 or 65,536. I will call all these individual binary numbers, I will call all of these individual binary numbers now states, okay? And in doing so, I will connect to the notion of physics where they will call these states too, okay? And it makes total sense because a 16-bit number can have any of one divided by two to the power of 16 states, okay? And that's where this comes from and it turns out that uh, the entropy in the equilibrium case, that means if each state has the same chance uh, of appearing, right? So if you know nothing about the 16-bit number, you know, you know nothing about it. So that means you have this, you, every number has the same chance. It is the same idea as binary search. So if I asked you to guess a number between zero and 15, what could you do? Well, you would say, okay, my first guess is, is your number smaller or equal than eight? My second guess is, is your number smaller or equal than four, depending on my answer, or greater or equal than 12? What you really do in this binary search is you fill in the bits of a binary number that I call it bits between zero and 15, and it turns out the maximum amount of guesses you need by doing so is locked to of 16 or four, okay? Now, and that's really interesting because this interplay of uncertainty and determinism actually, we use all the time in computer science, but we are not aware of the fact that this is actually quite brutal, okay? When you have every probable states and you use minus log two, uh, one divided by the probability of a state appearing, it is the same 
by logarithm rules than saying log two number of states. So the question, you could either go and ask, okay, if I have numbers between zero and 65, 535, how many bits do I need? And you say, okay, log two of 65,536 uh, is 16, right? Or you can say um, it's minus, 1 divided by 2 to the power of 16. A uh, log of that, sorry. Minus log 2, or 1 divided by 2 to the power of 16. It's mathematically absolutely the same. These are logarithm rules. These logarithm rules are what we learn in middle school. But the interesting part here is that it helps us understand the connection between certainty and uh, uncertainty, which is information. Information is reduction of uncertainty. If I have 16 bits of information, then this is, I, I reduced uh, one divided by, minus log two, one divided by two to the power of 16 um, possible, um, you know, branches of uncertainty, right? Um, I'm gonna go into this further in a little bit. So information is log two of the number of states and it's positive. And uncertainty is minus log two. It's negative, okay? Now, interestingly enough, again, you have the logarithm rule here, which is minus log two, one divided by number of states is the same as log two of the number of states. But what I propose we do from now on is we actually don't use the sign. And then it becomes really interesting because what it means is 16 bits of information is information, and minus 16 bits would be uncertainty, just like debt, okay? You can have $100,000, congratulations. You can also have minus $100,000. It's a very different situation, right? It means you owe somebody. Now, that's the interesting part. If you have positive bits, you have the information. If you have negative bits, you still have work to do. You owe the model this information. Okay, so that's how we're gonna look at it. And now people will say, okay, this is all cool, but what happens if the states are not equiprobable? What happens if it's way more, uh, way more uh, uh, interesting that, that like the zero happens 20 times as often as the rest of the one to 65,535? Well, Shannon gave us a formula for that. It's called the Shannon entropy, okay? And the Shannon entropy provides the absolute tight bound of how much information or how much uncertainty could be in there. Um, and that's important for the homework, okay? So we'll do some, we'll, this is obviously stuff that needs to, you get, need to get a bit better intuition for. And so I'm gonna ask you, to work on this a little bit in the homework using simple examples, okay? Now, here's the interesting part. How does that actually fit into our thought framework? How do we connect this back, right? We, we did a bunch of philosophy, but you wanna not just have to do random philosophy about information, you wanna actually figure out how does it connect back? Well, here's what's interesting. Let's say you have a table right, that has zeros and ones in there, right, as, as an outcome. So it's a cat, it's a dog, or uh, the drug is reactant or not reactant, right, that's an actually real outcome, okay? Or you'd say um, right or wrong, Simple, stuff like that, right? Now what's interesting here is when you conduct your experiment, right, so when you say, I don't know my formula yet, I'm just doing systematic research, then what's interesting here is there's a certain probability for the binary outcome. And the funny thing is, if you don't know anything, it's actually probable, okay? So if you toss a coin, but you say, okay, let's record those coin tosses with like, let's say the type of coin, the shape of coin, the weight of the coin, the weight of the person that, that has, you know, that flips the coin with his hand, like you take all these parameters, right? And you say, I want to reduce my uncertainty. I want to predict with more than random chance what the outcome is at heads or tails. By default, 
you have a 50% chance of predicting. You have basically minus one bit of uncertainty for each outcome, right? Minus log two, or basically log two, of one divided by two, two states, heads or tail, right? Since you have two states, heads or tail, we said log two of two is one, or minus log two of one half is also one, and we wanted to not keep the, the sign. That means each experiment gives you one bit of information, okay, in this particular experiment. That means before you have the observation, you have minus one bit of uncertainty, okay? And now the interesting part here is, if you took the uh, table and put that table after, let's say, 100,000 experiments with your heads and tails into a finite state machine, how many state transitions would you actually need, okay? And now we're going to take and keep the notions, to keep the notion that um, uh, our experiments were actually independent. Uh, and, and so, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, that our experiments were actually uh, as random as we make them. There was actually no pattern to be found between the size of the coin and all the attributes we put in. Well, guess what? It's a 50% chance for each experiment. And what it means is that the Shannon entropy would tell us there's nothing you can do if each row, if each outcome is one bit, then you have to model it, okay? So what it means now is this. You can see the trivial finite state machine, right? How would the trivial finite state machine look like? And hopefully you saw that in the lecture that I gave you homework. The trivial finite state machine would look like input, arrow, output, okay? Input is all our XIs, and the arrow goes to one of, uh, one of the outcomes of head or tail. And so for a really completely random table, we would actually need as many state transitions as we need for, uh, as we need for the table anyway. That means for a really completely random outcome, it's noisy. We don't find a pattern. We need to keep basically the same amount of states as the lookup table, okay? So memory capacity is where we end up with, just like the noisy image, because everything is random. Every next pixel is random. Every next outcome of the experiment is random. All we can do to reproduce is store with memory, okay? But, and now comes the interesting part, what if there was a pattern? What if there was actually something we could do? Well, then the question becomes, what am I actually looking at? What is the machine learner doing? And could I maybe use less than the memory capacity to, 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 uh, to make this smaller? And we know, for example, for the whale shark image, we can do that we can find a JPEG, well, nice thing, it, it wasn't there before, but now we have it. Like we can find maybe a neural network for this kind of thing and so on. Um, but for, for, for the image, we can find JPEG to make things smaller. And guess what? Now we know we have JPEG, so let's use it, okay? And that will be obviously our first experimental design decision to basically figure out which machine learning we should actually use. Um, and you will say later, okay, but deep learning solved it all. This is not completely true, um, but we will go to that later. Major point is there's different ways of compressing. Now, here's one very, 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 very important part of this. We are, have to be very careful. When we compress the whale shark image, where is the noise image, our goal is reproduction. That means I want the whale shark image uh, compressed, sent over a channel like the internet, and then the user, another user, can just look at the whale shark image again. Okay. Now, we don't do the same compression here. It's not like we want the lookup table compressed, right? It's not like we take our xi's and our f of x and just compress it. That's not the idea. What we want to compress 
is the state transitions between the xi and the f of x. So actually, we want to compress the function. Okay, it's a function compressor. We compress the function that is assumed between the inputs and the outputs. And here's what's very interesting. When we program normally, right, we can see programming as taking some input, then doing something, and then outputting something, right, which is regular programming, is creating a function in the computer. And now the question for me is, as we do that, where do we compress there, right? And it turns out we compress in various ways. One way is that we use formulas, right? Instead of a lookup table for all the values that E equals MC squared can assume, we put in E equals MC squared, right? And the computer knows how to actually multiply, right? And the other thing is um, that the, the, uh, the abstraction for, for working on data also comes from the while loop or the for loop or loop in general. The funny thing is loops help us to just define it once and then use the redundancies, the repetition automatically, right? And so I'm giving you a little bit of a hint of the programming that happened that we do with programming. And the reason why is that when we program by hand, it's very similar. In fact, you could see machine learning as programming by example. It's just basically, instead of explicitly programming the function and making that short, we program by example saying, okay, I have these inputs, give me that output. And in order to give you more intuition for this, let me explain you the Shannon number. Oh yeah, actually probably the Shannon number is, 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 is first and then we go back, okay? So the Shannon number, in 1950, right? It was completely new that automatic machines could do anything math, okay? So it was absolutely outrageous that anything but a human can do just even arithmetic, okay? And Shannon was obviously ahead of his time. Um, he invented information theory, but his information theory, the official part was mostly for communication. It was all about um, you know, how do I combine radar theory and telephono theory and all these theories into one single theory that makes a lot of sense. But what many people don't know is he also invented the first computer because he was the first one to take Boolean logic and put it into relays to do math. And his master thesis was absolutely impressive and, and it, it's so ahead of its time. And because he thought about both, he thought about first, how many, uh, how can I solve communication and how do we define information mathematically? He also thought about what if we actually had the computer do really difficult tasks like play chess against the human, okay? Now everybody will say chess is solved. But what he created back then was this theoretical concept of if you were playing chess, how complex of a computer would we need? And the interesting part is he came up with a number. The number was 10 to the power of 120, okay? Now 10 to the power of 120 is what he decided is the game tree, right? Um, and the game tree is ultimately, if you think about it as a huge tree, is like, first move, next move, first move, next move. And he defined the chess problem as, what is the path in the tree such that the white player wins, okay? And this is very interesting because we can also say, okay, when I play a game of chess, how much uncertainty is there that I can win given the perfect black moves, okay? So we also always have to assume that the adversary moves are perfect. Obviously, if you have imperfect moves, if you may win in three, right? But the point is assuming the black player defends himself or herself perfectly well. It takes the best move every time. What is the complexity of the chess game? What is the amount of uncertainty that I have as a chess player? And to just give you an idea, 
He said 10 to the power of 120. Well, that means that is the number of states of the decision tree. So all I have to do is I take the log two of 10 to the power of 120. And that is 398.63. And because I talked the log two of states, I can measure in bits. And that means it's about 400 bits. And now his game tree complexity had the assumption that the other player is perfect, but he didn't prune the tree or he didn't do any other optimization. And so since he didn't prune or do any other, add any other constraints of compression, we can call this complexity exactly the memory equivalent capacity. And to give you another intuition for memory equivalent capacity is, yeah, it means all possible chess games fit into that tree. That ginormous tree that assumes a perfect black player has all possible chess games that a white player starts and plays perfectly against a perfect black uh, opponent. Okay? All possible outcomes are in that tree. And you know, you'll be surprised. That's only 400 bits of memory. And I want you to keep the 400 bits uh, in mind, especially when we start understanding the memory equivalent capacity of different neural networks, because 400 bits is about not right, it would be 400 parameters in a three layer network, okay? 400 parameters in the right topology in a three layer network is nothing compared to the megabytes and terabytes that MIT uses for all these tasks. And how is it that chess is, it seems it's complicated, but it turns out to be not so complicated. But do we think that language is 10 times more complicated than chess or 100 times? Maybe, but I would doubt that language understanding is a million times more complicated, right? But they have terabytes of models, so that would be a billion times more complicated, okay? So ultimately, you can fit the perfect decision tree of chess in 400 bits of memory or 50 bytes. Now, there's overhead, right? When you actually implement that, <clears throat> you have to create a GUI, but also your, your decision tree will be a linked list of nodes and so on, and they take a lot more memory, okay? But it totally explains why chess computers came up pretty early and were actually pretty successful pretty early. And now here comes a very interesting part. Does it make a difference if you model the chess using a neural network that observes enough games? But where we basically go ahead and say, just like the approach from Google, remember they had this Go computer that, that actually, uh, uh, sort of solved go against the, the five fifth down world master champion, remember? I forgot what the name of the computer was. Some of you will know. But for me, it makes no difference whether you have the finite state machine modeled using observations, right? Or whether you explicitly go and say, hey, guess what? I know the rules of chess. I can just program them in. Ultimately, the decision tree that is created by both of them should only be about 400 bits, right? Should be worth the memory equivalent capacity of 400 bits. We, and the memory equivalent capacity, again, is all the images, right, of that resolution and, and that number of pixels fit into that memory. So all the chess games, all the decisions for the chess games uh, for um, uh, perfect black and a perfect white player fit into that memory. Now, of course, the next question is, what if they are imperfect, right? Then you probably need a little more or a little bit less. And also the other question is, can you prune? And now you see like where optimization comes from when you do it for real. But for now, let's keep it on this level, okay? And then I wanna repeat what I said last time. Remember, we had our sort framework and I said, we have intellectual capacity. Well, intellectual capacity was a number of unique target functions a machine learner is able to represent, usually as a function of the numbers of parameters. And um, that is exactly that, right? So how many different target functions do I need to represent such that I can learn chess, right? Because the function goes from 
from initial start of the game through perfect moves to winning one, right? Um, and if you want to do it a little, uh, a little more precise here, you just take current state of the game to winning, right? Um, so now, memory equivalent capacity is, again, a machine learner's intellectual capacity is memory equivalent to n bits when the machine learner is able to represent all two to the power of n binary labeling functions of any n inputs, okay? So what does that mean? It means that if you have any inputs, whatever, actually the, and we will work on this next time, the number of attributes doesn't matter in this notion right now. If you have a binary task, then really all functions you can create is are two to the power of n. There are no more functions, right? Because in your tar in your labeling uh, uh, column, you can only have zero or one, and that means it's a two to the power of the number of rows that you can create different functions. So what that means is, if I have memory it has the same capacity because memory itself is that. N bits of memory can represent two to the power of N different states. It's again, the same logarithm logic we had before, okay? So <clears throat> what we will assume from now on, remember we have this engineering trick, which is this one, right? We say memorization is worst case generalization. Because when I memorize, I cannot infer anything about values that are between the bits or that be between sort of the outcomes, right? So it's the same notion as Shannon saying, well, perfect black player, perfect white player, but I didn't prune the tree, okay? Because true pruning would mean that after a certain move, I know the outcome without looking at further moves, right? And that means that I'm not memorizing, I'm actually generalizing. Going to that point means I can generalize over all the different moves that could come later. So we don't prune the tree, okay? So basically we're saying memorization is our upper limit. Chess can only get more complex than 400 bits if and only if I don't do it right. That means I don't have a perfect player, I don't have uh, the right algorithm because maybe something I'm double checking or something, right? But with a perfect algorithm and the perfect players, the complexity is 400 bits. You may have a machine when you actually implement it that is less efficient, okay. But memorizing all possible games so that we, we become perfect is gonna be 400 bits, okay. But Shannon himself already said, if I use these 400 bits, then there's probably optimization that can be done. We can probably do this smarter. Okay, and that's basically what I'm saying. We should be smarter, right? Because only when we're smarter, we can start to generalize. So the main engineering tricks is using as many parameters as needed for memorization will not generalize. It will not go to a header data set because I basically have a lookup table. This is the machine learner overfits. Now there are exceptions to this rule, which we discussed earlier. But for now, we really have to say, if your machine learner is, and this is the third bullet here, at memory equivalent capacity, with respect to your table, you're overfitting. You're just memorizing the points that are in there, and it's absolutely not clear what happens between the points, okay? Now, the reason we have to treat it this way is because we obviously don't have a complete analytical understanding of the machine learner, okay? If we had a complete analytical understanding of the machine learner, like we do in the chess game, it would be much easier. But we treat machine learners as a black box, so the only thing we can say engineering and measurement-wise is, let's make sure the memory equivalent capacity of the machine learner ends up being much smaller than the memory equivalent capacity for the lookup table that I trained the machine learner with. Any questions so far? I know it can be a little bit overwhelming, but there will be homework for this. And I, this is all recorded, so you have a chance to re-listen uh, re, uh, to this lecture.
So now, because for this today's lecture, there's only one more question left. So the game tree complexity of the chess game is 400 bits. The next question is, but what if I trained a neural network? Could I use generalization to get to less than 400 bits? And it's not the homework for today, but the interesting part is this question is answerable even without training a neural network. And it will take us about two lectures and then you get there. And the answer, by the way, is absolutely yes. A neural network will use less than 400 bits because it can compress uh, irrelevancies away. Um, and we will get there. That's sort of all GMEM, by the way. But the next question we have to ask is, OK, if that's true, we're using these different algorithms, right? So how do we calculate the memory equivalent capacity of a given machine learner? And binary decision tree, like just like Shannon did, it's pretty freaking simple. It's the depth of the tree. Okay. So the depth of the tree um, comes automatically because you have a decision left, right? If that's 50% chance, it's one bit. Then you have another decision left, right, in each one of them. If that's another 50% for each one of them, that's two bits, and so on and so forth. So that's all the perfect tree. That's also why we need the perfect players and the perfect algorithm. The depth of the perfect tree is the memory equivalent capacity of that tree. Now for neural networks, and this will be the next lecture, it probably the next two lectures, um, because I, I did it last year in one lecture and I think it was a little fast. Um, the, the next two lectures are going to be, how do I find for a given network, the memory equivalent capacity, right? Because if I know the memory equivalent capacity, I can immediately compare it to what the decision tree would do in the same case. And also I can immediately compare it to the actual lookup table, which is just the number of instances, right? So the memory capacity of a lookup table or of my original training table is just the number of instances for binary balanced classification problem. And so now if my tree is smaller, I'm generalizing. And if my neural network has smaller memory equivalent capacity, I'm generalizing, okay? So for a random forest, it's very similar to a decision tree. You count the non-overlapping nodes. But I will also tell you, if you're interested in research, I will be very interested in people figuring out the, the memory equivalent capacity of a Gaussian mixture model, of a support vector machine, uh, SVM, not SVM, sorry, or of k-nearest neighbors. Right? So how do you transform them? Right? And we will work on this, um, uh, at least for the first uh, three. Um, and then you can think about for the other ones. But this is the way to normalize problem complexity in machine learning, is to ask yourself, okay, I have this lookup table. Compared to another machine learner that I have, how is that machine learner doing better than the lookup table or not, right? And you can totally measure this, A, with going over validation set, but you can quantify the generalization by dividing the memory equivalent capacity um, you have in your actual machine learner, uh, sorry, by dividing the number of correctly classified instances, which is sort of the number of states, divided by the memory equivalent capacity of your machine learner. And I, I quickly managed, that, uh, managed to give you that earlier, but it's not as simple as that because ultimately the number of attributes do something. And ultimately also, um, you could have just a lossy, com a lossless compression, which is another problem. And there's inherent generalization, even for random numbers, um, in all these different machine learners. And once you go to imbalanced, you have to change that. And once you go to multi-class, you have to change that again. Okay, that's why this will take uh, again after we got the memory equivalent capacity of neural networks, we will go to that. And once you get to there, um, you'll have a lot of um, power, sort of conceptual power, to just basically, I can tell you, 
go through different um, machine learning papers from other people or yourself and ask yourself, okay, wait a minute, if I play these measurements here, what does this actually mean for my experimental design? And of course, that is the trick. And um, again, so just to summarize what, what's ahead before, we, uh, before I open up the question is, what this class does, it gives you machine learning as an engineering discipline, right? And we will, you will learn that supervised machine learners all have a memory kernel capacity in bits that is computable and measurable. That artificial neural networks with gating functions, for example, have a capacity upper limit that it can be determined analytically, okay, using four principles. Now, you might say that seems impossible. It's not, because the original invention of the neural networks in the 1950s, 60s, well, I need to go back to my slides, um, saw single neurons and then how to put them in parallel and how to put them in series. They saw single neurons as uh, components in a circuit. And looking at it this way, you can use circuit laws to understand what's going on. And if you're not sure that I'm right, I will give you a method to measure it too, because that will be very helpful. So there's always an empirical validation, obviously. And then I will tell you that predicting and measuring capacity allows for task-independent optimization, right? Because now you go and say, huh, uh, first of all, is this network the same as this other network? Or is this network the same as this decision tree? But then also once you have a task, you know, oh, it should be this. No, this must be better because it uses less parameters. Um, and I will show you how capacity requirement can be approximately predicted given the input data and the ground truth. So the idea is given the label data and the ground truth, right? So, uh, sorry, input data and the ground truth. Um, basically given the training table. And the interesting part here is that we already know that the number of rows is the memory cooling capacity of the lookup table. Um, but we can go actually a little beyond that. It's going to be very interesting. So we're going to compare hash tables to uh, neural networks and so on, because um, there's actually a, a very tight uh, notion. And once you have sort of this measurement ideas, um, you know, we'll then be ready to actually work on audio and video data. And it's, you're going to ask yourself why, why is, finding a dog from a cat um, is like 10, 10 billion times or no, it was 100 million times, 100 million times harder than chess. And of course that's wrong, okay? You will find out that um, it's not that hard. Um, but we get there. Um, anyway, um, any questions? I'm completely open to questions. And also if you have more questions, uh, please visit me and obviously an unrecorded uh, lecture session uh, on Monday at 1 p.m. As I said, it's my office hours. Um, I will make this easier for you and just basically stop the recording so you, you it may be easier for you to ask questions, okay? Um, which would be... Uh,